So uh, some people came late, so I'm going to reintroduce myself. My name is Arla, A-R-L-A. Uh, I have been in this community for 29 years. I used to actually work for SAD 44 in something they had called Creative and Talented. I taught that for six years, and then it got lost in the budget. So I kept what I was doing with those kids privately, and it was called Explorations. And actually, you took it one summer. Um, I taught that for 25 years, and I just ended it last fall. Three and a half years ago, I had something that we can call a leading. It's that thing where your emotions, your intuition, just calls you to do something. And the thing was, for me, addressing what happened to indigenous people. So what do I mean by indigenous? Do you guys know that word? Native. Native. Native, yeah. Who was here for thousands and thousands of years before we got here? We are the settlers. We are the people who came. The original people are called indigenous. So when I was 12, I'd heard some of the things that had happened to indigenous people, and it really broke my heart. And I thought, someday, someday, I'm going to do something about it. Well, following your leading means letting that emotion guide you. So I went on the, the computer, and I put in a search. And I said, Native Americans, Maine, and Quakers, because I'm a Quaker. And I knew that the Quakers had been involved on some level. What came up was? the first truth commission in this entire country on what happened to Native children. And it's called the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So we call it TRC. So what I did is I started to volunteer. And I volunteered for a year and a half. Now, volunteer means I drove up to Indian Island three hours. I drove back. I sat in meetings. I spent a lot of my own time, money, effort because it really meant a lot to me. I started talking to local groups when I found out the information I found out. I talked to the Rotary. I talked to the Congo Church. Um, in any case, this is more telling you about what I was doing. But I think the background is important that I, here I was, a teacher, an art teacher, just like Melissa. And yet, I had this other thing that I wanted to pay attention to. After a year and a half, they saw what I was doing. And they made me the community engagement coordinator. And so I've continued to do that work. Um, what happened it, today, I want to do a few things. I want to, the reason we're in a circle is because I want to tell you some of the things I've learned from indigenous people. But I also want to share with you why we have a truth commission. And, and that's a PowerPoint. Um, and then I do want to talk about what you can do to make a difference. Because it's really hard for Mainers to understand how historic this is. We're not only the first truth commission in the United States. We're the first commis truth commission worldwide that was made from grassroots people and government agreeing. This came from the bottom up. This came from people like you and me, not from the government like in South Africa or in Canada. So it's completely unique. And we're being watched by the world. We're, we're being studied by a university in Scotland. We're being written about. There's a huge conference in Washington, DC in June about this. And our people who are involved in this are going to go speak in it. So it's really, really huge. And it's all about just regular people making a difference. OK, so the reason that we're in this circle is because power structures can be vertical and they can be horizontal. This is a horizontal power structure. Every person in this room matters and is equal in this circle. The power stru structure that's vertical means there's a guy at the top with all the power, and then it goes down like that. And usually, who's at the bottom is indigenous and women and people of color. So does anybody know the word consensus? Have you heard that word? Yeah, You've heard of it? Do you know what it is? Yeah, that's, that's, that's in the right direction. Yes. Yes, you have a complete agreement. Now, the problem with consensus is it's slower. But if you look at voting, that means that if 54 people won, that means that there are 60, no, excuse me. 46. Thank you. <laughs> Math is not my suit. Uh, 46 people who didn't agree, who were dissatisfied, who's not, it wasn't their vision. The thing about consensus is it waits until everybody agrees and it brings it forward. 
Um, one of the things I just would like to start with, and you guys are already pretty much doing it, which is awesome, is have some agreements on how we're going to be in this little period of time that we have together. Um, have you ever heard taking 20 pounds and trying to put it in a one pound bag? That's basically what we're going to be doing. I have so much to cover with you that I'd love for you to hear. And so what it requires is exactly what you're doing now, that when the speaker is speaking, you don't um, talk over them, and it could be somebody else. And the other thing is that you don't do any side comment. If you have a comment, please share it with the whole group. It's like that, would, that slows us down. So those are the agreements that I was hoping that you would have. And is everybody in agreement? OK, so that's consensus that we have right there, that everybody's in agreement. The other thing that's very important, and indigenous people, this is how they work. This is how their community moves forward. This is how they make decisions, is by consensus. Coincidentally, my own spiritual path as a Quaker, that's how we make decisions also. And it also means that sometimes it can take a long time. I'll give you one reason why consensus could be really powerful. In the early days of Quakers during slavery, the belief is, is that all the birds could be flying in the wrong direction. There could be one person or two people who see it in a different way. And that's exactly what happened with slavery. There were Quakers in Quaker meeting who just realized that it was not OK to own another person. So they would speak up. And then more people would speak up. And then more people would listen to them. And then eventually, this other idea came about. So we need voting, and we need the majority rule to make the country move forward. But it's also important to understand that there is another way also of doing things a different way that could come with a different outcome. And I think slavery is one really good example of how not having, by having consensus, that, that an idea could take hold. So to get every voice in the circle, because we had a great exercise and we saw lots of people participate, but one of the things that happens is you've ever heard the E versus the I? Do you guys know about extrovert versus introvert? Have you come across that? Yes, no? Well, those people who spoke and spoke so easily, they're the E's. That's me. I'm an E. I'm an extrovert. Extroverts are figure stuff out by saying it. And they're not afraid to say it. And, they, and the sound of their voice out in the room is fine. Introverts process things internally. It might take longer. They don't say anything until they've sort of thought about it and have their idea more clear. Now, in a classroom situation, the introverts often get left behind because it's the way the class runs. So what we're going to do is a little activity really quick. We don't have a lot of time for this whole thing, and I have all this other information I want to give you. But I think it's really important to get every voice in the circle. So I do something called ally trainings in Maine, where I go uh, receive information. Because basically what I'm about to do to you, I'm about to give you a ton of information. And what it is is put your fingers on the front of your ears and just massage the edge of your ear all the way around. And I actually kind of get like a little bit of a, no, no, like really like this. Like really massage all the way around, and then come all the way back up. And some of you kind of get a little bit of a chill up your back. But what it does, apparently, is it really opens up your brain and helps you to receive information, because this is a lot of information. Um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you also is that the reason that I have a script is because it is very hard for Wabanaki people to have non-Wabanaki people out there talking about them. And they need to know what it is that we're saying. And you'll understand a little bit more why that is a little bit challenging for anyone who is indigenous in this country. So as I mentioned to you before, the, that's the full name up there. Let me tell you what Maine Wabanaki reaches. And this is another example of where somebody can have multiple skills. It happens that they wanted to have a logo, and they told me they wanted a dragonfly. They said that they wanted the native tribes represented, and they wanted the rest of the state of Maine represented. Well, I designed that one of the, of the um, dragonfly using the tribal symbols in the wings for the four tribes, and then making the body out of blueberries, because the whole state has been sustained on blueberries, both native and non-native. So that represents REACH. What REACH is, it stands for Reconciliation, Engagement, Advocacy, Change, and Healing. It's a group of people that that's who I work for, both native and non-native, who work together to try to help prepare the communities for the work of the commissioners. The commissioners go around and hear people's stories. They're not just hearing native people's stories. They're hearing the stories of the white people who were involved in this situation as well. 
So as I mentioned, it's historic. Not every, uh, we're the first one, we're the first state, and every state has a history like this. So my hope is, I'm 64 years old, I really hope I see before I die that this travels and every state in the country has a truth commission about what happened to Native children. Uh, it used to be that um, this was all Wabanaki territory. Um, the other thing that I really need to tell you about this presentation is, as somebody who grew up in the 60s, I did not learn any of this. This is all news. And when I go around talking to groups of people in Maine, this isn't the information that they had either. You may know some of this because you guys have been studying about this land that we're on and what the history is. But you may also have things that you find out today that could really be upsetting. Some of the information that I came across brought me to tears. It, it was emotionally challenging. So it could be that you have a strong feeling about it. It could be that um, you might even feel guilty being a, a white settler. Um, you might even feel shame. But what I'm saying is you can take those feelings and you can turn them into fuel, which is what I've done. And I've used that fuel to fuel action. And action is a great way to help change something and to, to help with healing something that needs healing. The other thing is, is as Mainers, you can be really proud of the fact that this state, as small a population as it has, one area code for the whole huge state, it's not very many people, we are leading the nation in this. And it does make sense because the name Wabanaki actually means <coughs> the people of the land of the dawn. We are where the sun first comes up on this continent and hits Eastport, hits Maine first. So that's why their name is the, the people of the land of the dawn. That's what Wabanaki means. So Wabanaki is the confederacy. Under that, there are four tribes, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Penobscot, and the Passamaquoddy. So those are the four tribes left. There had been 20 originally. So this was all originally Wabanaki territory. This is what remains of Wabanaki territory today. And you're not seeing reservations. You're also seeing stuff they call fee lands. The reservations are tiny little dots of that. In fact, those are the, the five reservations. And the reason they're five is that there are two for the Passamaquoddy. And you can see where we are down in Oxford County. They're all pretty far away from us, which is why my, my meeting this week is on Indian Island. So that's a good three hour drive each way for a meeting. So traveling around has been pretty challenging. Um, the, th the reason that we have this script, oh, I think I told you, is just to make sure that the information that's going out is consistent with what um, the Wabanaki would want us to be saying. So one of the other things that's really important to understand is that there has been a 96% population depletion since first contact. 96% population depletion. And that has been the result of uh, disease, wars, and policies specifically designed to, to reduce the numbers. So there's something very deeply foundational behind the way we as white people in this country have treated Native people from the very, very beginning. And when I found out about this, a whole lot of things made more sense to me. And what it has to do with is this man. This is Pope Nicholas V. So you have to realize, we're talking 40 years before Columbus even sailed. He would put out things called edicts, or the papal bull. It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that it was called the papal bull? <laughs> anyway, you'll hear more about that. Um, it was called Dom Diversus. And what it did is it said that it, it promoted and sanctioned the conquest, the colonization, and the exploitation of non-Christian territories. Basically, what that says is, you land on a land, and they're not Christians then they're the enemies of Christ. And you can, here's what you can do. Capture, vanquish, and subdue those Saracens and pagans and other enemies of Christ. You can put them into perpetual slavery. You can take all their possessions and property. Basically, you, they're, they're just deer and moose. You can do what you want to with them. Now, this foundational doctrine of discovery is an attitude that is still in operation, I'm sorry to say, as recently as 2005, the doctrine of discovery was cited in a case against the Oneida Nation of New York, in a case called Sherrill versus the Oneida. It was cited as the reason, doctrine of discovery. 
Now, what's actually helpful is that starting in 2009, there's been a movement to repudiate the doctrine of discovery, and it started again in Maine with the Episcopal Church in Maine. And I know the man who, John Diefenbacher Kroll, who was behind that movement. The, so the whole Episcopal Church came out against repudiating means to, to say this is not valid, this is not true. Um, the World Council of Churches, the Religious Society of Friends, which are the Quakers, the Unitarian Universalist Church, and then just this last spring, the United Church of Christ, which is like our Congo Church in in Bethel, they came out against this. But it's really important to know that like all Native people in the Americas, the Wabanaki tribes were targeted for destruction. Now, one of the most painful examples is this one. When I first found out about this, this was one of those ones that I, I was very, very moved by because I did not know this. This is called the Spencer Phipps Proclamation, and there's Spencer Phipps. He was the acting royal governor of Massachusetts. This was a bounty on the heads of Penobscot people. So in other words, you're Penobscot, I get to kill you, and I get 50 pounds. Oh, sorry, you're a woman. I only get 35. They had an amount for men, women, and children. They had an amount for under 12, which means any little toddler that you know of that was native could bring in money. Now, this just totally, totally astounded me when I found out about this. And here's the thing, it was on Penobscot, but who knew back in 1755 any native person, they didn't know if you're Maliseet or Micmac, so essentially every person who was native in this territory was fair game. So think about Maliaka, she was seven, 1740 to 18, 1816. She survived the Spencer Phipps Proclamation. Now, the part about this that's really disturbing, and I have a, I mean, this is an actual, this is the actual proclamation. For every scalp of such female Indian or male under the age of 12, 20 pounds, but 50 pounds was the bounty for a man. And what you need to understand is 50 pounds in 1755 was a year's salary for clergy. Can you imagine how rich you could get? And lots and lots of white people did. They got very, very rich on this. Only like one time, eh? Yes. So, and the thing is, is that um, the, you could go into um, the, the stations. You didn't have to go all the way to Boston. You could go into a station in Wiscasset, and there was another one in Augusta. And the clerk would literally say, how many redskins you got for me today? If you brought three, you've got three years of salary. I mean, it was an incredible amount of money. So now I hope you can understand how painful it is for, to be a native person and hear the national team of DC be called the Redskins. It's saying, you know, we're gonna kill you and take your scalp. I grew up thinking that scalping was only what native people did. I never knew that we did it. I never knew it came over from the Celts in, in, the, great, in the British Isles. I, I always thought it was just a native, not that they didn't also maybe, but I had it be totally their fault. Um, so anyway, here are the bounties um, listed out. The history that I learned certainly did not um, encounter this, this level of, of destruction. Um, there's another tactic here documented by this letter that was widely believed to be used not only by the British, it's called uh, infusing blankets and clothing with smallpox to deliberately kill people. So this guy, Colonel Henry Bouquet, wrote this letter to General Amherst, or maybe this is General Amherst's letter back in 1763, so not that much later, 55 to 63, and it suggested that um, the distribution of such, such blankets, here's the quote from the letter, to inoculate the Indians, um, to try every other method that you can to serve to extirpate, that means extirpate means get rid of, this excrable, excrable means extremely bad or unpleasant race. So there it is in black and white if you ever had any um, idea that that was a myth. Another device that was used against native people was alcohol. And that was very starkly revealed by this quote from none other than Benjamin Franklin. Here's what Benjamin Franklin said in his autobiography of 1750. Quote, if it be the design of providence to extirpate, 
that was their like favorite word back then, I guess. Eradicate, destroy is what extirpate means. If it is be the design of providence to extirpate these savages in order to make room for the cultivators of the earth, it seems not improbable that rum may be the appointed means. So indigenous people have been the most heavily legislated group in this country. Um, during the um, 19th century, there were four congressional acts that I'm just going to tell you about. One was the Civilization Fund. That provided money that will fund the schools that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. The second one was the Indian Removal Act. And you might have heard of it called the Trail of Tears. Have any of you heard the Trail of Tears? OK. Um, what we typically didn't know is that in, Native people were pu pulled off their land and rounded up and kept in camps. And they were kept there for the summer, waiting until the winter, so that there would be an even harder journey. Um, they set out, um, and they didn't, the government didn't provide for any basic supplies, like food or shoes. Over 4,000 people died en route. And most of us didn't realize, I never realized, that it wasn't just the Cherokee on the Trail of Tears. These were multiple removals for that removal act. Um, and you can see all those different lines. The groups of people who were removed are the Choctaw, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, and the Cherokee. The Indian Removal Act was one of the most significant tools in destroying native culture. The third one is this one, which was the Dawes Act. And the Dawes Act was in 1887. It authorized 93 million acres of tribal lands and took them out of native control to make them available for white settlers. And out of the mouth of President Theodore Roosevelt, you can understand the thinking of the time, because this is a quote from him. He said, the Dawes Act was a mighty pulverizing engine to break up the tribal mass. So the message is pretty clear. All right, is anybody feeling uh, like, oh my gosh? This is hard. Believe me, this is hard to let all this in. Um, but it's the truth, and that's what a truth commission is about. It's about getting the truth out to people. OK, I'm worried about time. How long do we have? 35, OK. Um, the other thing that I find very crazy making is, you know how this country was um, settled on religious freedom? Wasn't that why they, our ancestors all came here, religious freedom? Well, guess what? Native, Native people were experiencing an assault from every angle, and the one thing that could be a lifeline would be their spiritual practices, and they were outlawed. In 1882, the Secretary of the Interior ordered an end on reservations to, quote, the heathenist dances and ceremonies as they were a hindrance to civilization. And it took almost 100 years before Congress outlawed the persecution of natives who were carrying out their own spiritual practices. That was called the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, was finally passed in the 70s. So another really difficult fact, um, you guys haven't had a chance to vote yet. But for those of us who vote, we hold that very sacred. That is um, one of our biggest rights as Americans is to be able to vote and to impact our lives in that way. Well, I think you might have known that when black men got the right to vote, have you studied that? It was 1870. Now, we have to say the Jim Crow laws made that more challenging, that it wasn't that easy for black males to vote. The Jim Crow, law, Crow laws definitely put a, but it was on the books, and it was passed, and it was acknowledged that black men had the right to vote. Anybody know when we got it, women? Good, yes, bravo. He gets the brownie point today. 1920, women got the right to vote. It was not until, ready for this, 1954 before Native people had a right to vote. 1954, I was four years old. Now, the reason why, and in Maine, Native people did not get a right to vote in Maine elections, local elections, until 1967. Now, the reason why this is particularly um, upsetting is because Native people have served in every single military conflict since the very beginning of this country, and, by the way, in disproportionate numbers to the rest of the population. These are the code talkers that spoke Navajo that helped us win World War II, and yet they could not vote. They fought and died for a country that they could not vote in. 
So for over 200 years, the federal government had policies that were based on an assumption that annihilation or assimilation of the tribes was the best solution to what they called the Indian problem. And one of the things that, this is, this is one of the hardest things for, I think, for Euro-Americans to absorb, that when I found this definition made by the UN of the prevention and crime of genocide, um, I, I was just literally blown away. Because as I read these definitions, um, now this is the, a world unit, you know, the UN, deciding to define genocide. And they have it all listed. And they said, genocide is an act or acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. These would include the killing of the members, the causing of serious bodily harm, blah, 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 blah. Here's the stunning thing. We did every single one of them. We fit every single gen definition of genocide. And this TRC is about Article 2, Section E, the forcible transfer of children from one group to another. So here's the thing. Without us recognizing this truth, without us acknowledging this truth, great harm has been done to this group of people. It's really important that it stops here and we say, this is the truth. This is what happened. Now, how can we go forward? And you can see Article 2, Section E, the forcible removal of children. So then in 1956, the government passed the Indian Relocation Act. They took 30,000 Indians off the, tr off the reservations with the promise of jobs and housing and education in the cities, which didn't come through in most cases. And what happened is they um, resulted in huge poverty and alcoholism rates. And then in the 60s the, and 70s, they took 90,000 more. Um, now, this article is very revealing of the attitude at the time because it says, here's the quote, Cleveland is going to get some new Indians, but this is no baseball story. Honest Injun, these are real Indians. The first to arrive before another moon goes by will be an 18-year-old maiden, da, 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 da. So you can hear the attitude is sort of that doctrine of discovery where they're not really equal. They're not really us. One of the things about having it be a mascot is, um, that you then are not equal. You're a little symbol. You're not equal to the other person, which I think is a very, um, I have a longer quote, but we don't have time for that. OK, so what happened is you have all these native people taken from all different tribes off the cities, I mean, off the reservations, and they're in the cities. They start to talk to each other. They start to compare notes. And then they realize that this larger picture has been happening. They find out that there's 11 pieces of legislation in, the, in Washington that's going to come down that are negative for Native people. So they organized, they were called the American Indian Movement, AIM, the American Indian Movement. And they, they organized what they called the Longest Walk. They went from Alcatraz Island all the way across the country to draw attention to these 11 pieces of legislation. And it took them six months to get across. And when they arrived in Washington, they petitioned to the government to please not, you know, to, to be fair and to not do this. And two really positive things came out of that. One was the, the religious freedom one I told you about. And the other one we're going to talk about is called the Indian Child Welfare Act. And that's to protect children from being taken. OK, now, to tell you why that we have this TRC, we have to go back to this guy. We have to go back a little bit to show you this history. Are you overwhelmed? Is this too much information? You're following me? You're staying with me? It's hard, isn't it? Or maybe it's because you're young. Yeah, keep doing that. My ears are really hot. Um, OK. Here's the thing. How many people knew that Native children were taken out of their homes, that it was a law? OK, so you've heard this before. OK, it got to be at the point where um, the idea of fighting the Indians got to be too much, and they had to figure out another way. And this man figured out, his name was Henry, Kurt, Henry, Richard Henry Pratt. And he had the idea that what we needed to do was round up all the Native kids and take them off the reservations and kill the Indian in them in order to save the man in them. That was his slogan, kill the Indian to save the man. So what he did is he established a system of residential schools for Native children. And it was required that Native children attend the residential schools until they were 16. They were taken as young as four. 
in some cases, off the reservation, and it was to ensure that they gave up their savage beliefs. So these are the before and after pictures that were used to prove that they were better off. Um, the last US school closed in 1984. The boarding schools reached their peak in the 1970s in the US, and the last Canadian residential school was in 1996. So torn from their families and communities, Native children were expected to forget all that they had learned. Some more before and after. One of the most famous Indian industrial schools is the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It operated from 1870 to 1918, and that was the one that was founded by Colonel Pratt. Over 10,000 Native children were removed from their homes and tribes and brought to Carlisle. They were stripped of their identity. Their dress was changed. Their hair was cut. They were given a Christian name. They were doused with DDT powder, and they were forbidden to speak their language. They got beaten if they spoke their language, and they were not allowed to communicate with their own siblings. So imagine you at four leaving your parents and your sister or brother you can't talk to, and you have no one parenting you. You're like in a boarding school. You're in like in a military school. You only have nuns or um, priests or any other. They had thought lots of different religious groups that did this. Um, so no, no love, no loving, no hugging, um, no uh, speaking your own language. Um, being given a name like if you want to translate the difference, like you would be given the name something like Gisitanamuk or Gishekanekwe or, I mean, it's as foreign as that for them to be called Ralph or Richard or Mary. Um, over a thousand of them died while they were there and it served as a model for the Canadian system. So mostly the Penobscot were taken. Here's some records of some of them, but what they've also found out is that um, many of them were sent back to the wrong tribe because they just didn't get the names right or whatever, the rec record keeping. Now, the northern tribes, um, which would be the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, and up north, were taken up to Nova Scotia, Canada, to this boarding school, which is called Shubenagadi. And the same thing with Shubenagadi. Um, it was run by the Catholic Order from 1922, closed in 68. I actually know a native man in Maine who went there. Um, again, a story of stripping everything they knew. They returned home as teenagers, and they'd lost their ability to speak their language or making it impossible for them to fit in. Um, they'd not been parented. They had no sense of family. Some never returned home at all. Um, with the loss of family ties and culture and experiencing no parenting, their hearts shut down to survive emotionally. Now, this brings up a term called intergenerational trauma. Intergenerational trauma is when the trauma is experienced by one generation, and that damage gets impacted on the next generation, and that gets impacted on the next generation. The way you may have heard of it, and in my own personal experience growing up in an alcoholic home, Alcoholism is one of those things that impacts multiple generations until, until one generation decides they're going to they're gonna heal it. So um, we have how much more minutes? Thir ten? Um, OK, essentially, the story goes that this is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And this is a major national organization called the Child Welfare League of America. And when I guess the boarding schools were kind of like, they were still going on, but they were trying to think of another way. What happened was that they created an experiment, and the experiment was to prove that Native children were better off. It was called the Indian Adoption Project, and it went from 1958 to 1967. One of my colleagues that I work with, Denise Altvader, was one of the kids taken off of Sibayak, the Passamaquoddy Reservation, in the 50s. Um, they were uprooted from their homes. In some case, they're perfectly safe and loving homes and adopted by white families. Now, what Denise says is it wouldn't even matter if it was a, a good home. The point was the trauma was in the taking. Decades later, she still suffers the impact of that happening to her. So some of them were never returned home, and Native people call those their lost relatives. The researchers deemed that the experiment was a failure and that Native children were actually not better off in white homes, but they continued the project under another name called ARENA and they took an additional 255. 
So the Indian Child Welfare Act, it was essentially, uh, that was one of the things that happened when they did that longest walk. This is essentially saying, if you're gonna take a native child, first of all, you have to inform the tribe that you're gonna do it. Secondly, you have to try to find another family member. Thirdly, if you can't find another family member, find another member of the tribe. And if you can't find another member of that tribe, at least find another native tribe. So the, the important thing is to keep that culture intact, especially when you look at what happened to them and how much we tried to rip it apart and destroy it. These are children at um, Matakmikuk, which is one of the Passamaquoddy tribes. Now, in the 1950s, 35% of native children were being taken nationwide. So uh, over a third of the kids are still being taken nationwide. And despite the ICWA legislation, Maine continued to have one of the highest rates of removal. In 1984, it was 19 times higher than any other state. Indian children in Maine continued to be placed in white homes without asking or telling the tribe. In the late 1990s, 16% of all Maliseet, they're the furthest north tribe, were in out-of-home placements and the majority were white homes. So in 1999, the federal government, the feds came up to Maine to see how we were complying with this ICWA law, right? And they found that we were very, very much out of compliance. So they reached out to DHHS. DHHS is the Child Welfare Department of Health and Human Services. And they collaborated and they made a film. And they trained 500 workers. But what they realized is that there was still something that they weren't, nobody was talking about. They weren't talking about the context and the history. And all these white people really didn't even know the history. So what they did is they realized that this is part of the training the ICWA training, but then they realized that they actually needed to um, go beyond that. And that's when this group of people, which is a combination of native and non-native social workers, and the one guy has, is actually the head of DHHS, they decided that they were gonna try to do a truth commission. The first thing that happened is the native people had to realize what was still impacting them and what happened to their families. One thing about uh, trauma is you can keep it suppressed for many, many years, and then you can figure it out later, like you start realizing what happened to you later. So a lot of these people were just in survival mode, and then they started to talk about it and realized that, oh my gosh, yes, my grandmother was taken. Oh yes, oh, and they, and they had to work through that. And then the white social workers and the native social workers got together, and they hammered out a declaration of intent and this is when I came in on the scene because I found out about this declaration of intent. And that was in, I think, 12 or 11. Yes, that was in 11, the declaration of intent. And that was signed by the governor. And then a year later, we had the signing of the actual, whoops, why did that do that? The mandate signing, which was in 2012. And those are the chiefs of the, um, Brenda Commander is the first one on the end of the table. She's the only female, she's Maliseet um, chief. And then um, Kirk Francis, then the governor, and then the other three are the Maliseet and Passamaquoddy governor, um, chiefs. So the purpose is to find the truth, to help healing happen for both Wabanaki people and white people, actually, and to create change. These are our commissioners, whoops. Um, we have five commissioners. There are two native people that are commissioners. The first one on the left, Gisa Tanamuk, is actually um, Wampanoag, and he teaches at UMO. And then the next man is our Secretary of State, Matthew Dunlap. The third one is Carol Wishcamper, who's an educator. The fourth one is our only out of state, but she's a uh, Lakota, um, Sakunja Lakota. She, her name is Sandra Whitehawk. And then um, the last one is the head of um, social work department, Gerald Werbach, uh, up at UMO. They've been out for 27 months going to all the communities and going to the non-native communities too to hear from adopted families and lawyers and all those folks. Um, they are coming up on the conclusion of what they found. And they're going to make recommendations for better, better policies going forward. Now, this is their first visit to a community up, up um, Sipayek. That's the morning fire ceremony of beginning. And um, one of the things, I'm not going to read every single one of these to you, but one of the things that this has produced, this history, it's actually a, a genocidal history. 
What it has produced is the most socioeconomically distressed communities. In other words, all of their stats of suicide, diabetes, um, violence, um, alcoholism, drug abuse, all are way beyond what the, what the average person in, the, in this country is. So for example, here's just one. The life expectancy for a native person in Maine is 54 years. The life expectancy for a non-native, us guys, is 78.6. That's one statistic that can help you realize the difference in their lives. They are the least likely to be a homeowner and the most likely to be homeless in their own territory. But in every single one, especially suicide rates are really, really high. These are striking examples, but in every measurable way, these communities are distressed. And the thing is, these realities do not represent who Native people are. It's not because, this is what Esther has said, I'm quoting Esther Atian. She says, it's not because we're stupid, lazy, or unlucky. These numbers are the direct result of being targeted for destruction. So um, what does this all mean for us? For Maine, it means that we've inherited this legacy. The TRC is a process of decolonization and unpacking this legacy of racism and genocide. White people have to acknowledge what our ancestors have done to Native people. We have to reconcile the guilt we feel, which mean metabolizing grief that we might not have ever dealt with. We have to undo the racism that we've inherited, and we have to look at our own privilege, whether it's racial, economic, or gender. And we have to recognize how we benefit from the fact that they were targeted. I own 19 acres. I live on a beautiful mountain. I look at the whole presidential range. I swim in a beautiful, clean lake. I breathe this clean air, the quiet of Maine. Somebody paid a price for me to do that. And most of us don't even recognize that. We don't realize that. Is it almost time? OK. So um, the only thing I just wanted to say to you guys, is it actually time to go? OK, thank you, though. And actually, I should have asked for um, timekeepers um, earlier. This, this assault to Native people is not over. I just let me say that again. This assault to Native people is not over. Right now, right now, the Penobscot, I want you guys to hear this, because this is really important. It's not just all history. It's happening now. The Penobscot Nation, which is the islands in the Penobscot River, and the reason they're called Penobscot is because they are of the river, they are from that place. They were told that they could have those islands as their reservation and all the land on either side for a certain distance. Then they were told they couldn't have the land on either side. Now the state of Maine is suing them and telling them they don't have any right to the water that surrounds their islands. Now part of the way they survive is subsistence fishing. They fish. They, like they always have for thousands of years. So they're in a fight right now. And a lot of what we call people who support Native people allies, a lot of the allies are speaking up and using our voices on behalf. In fact, one woman in Orono found out that her town of Orono was in the suit against the Native people. And she said, does my town even know we're in this suit? She got the town to say, wow, we don't want to be in this suit. And they pulled themselves off. They are, not, they are no longer in the suit against. And the federal government, the EPA, said the water quality has to be clean enough that they can eat the fish. And Janet Mills, district head of district attorney, is that her name? Uh, she is suing the federal government for them saying that. So you know, there's many, many ways that you can speak up. What Esther calls it, Esther Atian is my supervisor. She's Passamaquoddy. She calls it leveraging your privilege. Because sometimes people don't listen when Native people speak up, but they might listen when we speak up. So you can make a difference. I'm one person, and I ask that we no longer have Miss Maliakit. And this was the poster that I collaborated on the first year that we didn't have Miss Maliakit locally. We now have an essay challenge that actually all of you could participate in. You get $350 if you win. And the essay challenge is the truth about what happened in this community, what the truth is about Native people. And this was the second year that I collaborated on the poster with um, a, a Passamaqua uh, Penobscot artist named James Francis. And this is this year's poster, which I tried to depict who Molly Ockett looked like because she's pre-photography. And I was trying to figure out she's tall. She stood very, very straight. 
and she had a great presence and she was considered, they called her handsome and tall. So I tried to depict her in that way. But I'm one person and I changed a 56 year history of being disrespectful. There's no way that any native woman would ever draw attention to herself, dress up and wave to the crowd and say, look at me, look at me. Their belief is when you do something of value, you do it for the whole community. The last thing you do is put yourself out front and take attention and credit for it. And it was also kind of like a mascot. It was keeping our thoughts about native people as if they are just in this little glass case in history. They're not our equals and they're not alive and well today with needs. Uh, we need to stop. Okay, um, I really appreciate you guys listened hard and that was a lot and it was a lot of hard stuff that I gave you. Um, I'm gonna give my email to Melissa and if you want to ask more questions, if you wanna tell me how you feel or give me any feedback, um, you can have that conversation with me. But this was, a, this was a lot to take in. So thank you for listening. You guys did an excellent job listening. I thank you for being present and being great active listeners. And uh, yeah, thank you. What'd you say, hon?